Thanks, Joaquin. Now we will hear from uh, David Reyes from Impulso Socialista of Colombia. I cannot turn on the camera. That's it. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, comrades who are listening to us in this uh, conference that the International Socialist League has organized. Our only alternative against capitalism and for the socialist revolution. In Colombia, there has been a uh, semi-feudal economic structure through bilateral organization, which is based in the exploitation of the primary resource sector, which is also combined unequally with the exploitation, uh, wage exploitation, either in the countryside or in the cities. That is how in our country, the 1% of the population holds 52% of monetary wealth and the 80% of the land, productive land. That is how in our country, the profits of the Wushasi are held by them, but the losses are socialized. This is a general reality and the working class now faces a complex situation in which today we see uh, main key elements. First is the unemployment rate, which is of uh, 80%. The informal jobs, which uh, represent 60%. The minimum wage, which is one of the lowest of Latin America, it's on, only covers 61% of the basic base, base basket. And only 1.5% of workers can actually access to it. And only 60% of workers can retire in this kind of model, they 60% of the workers can retire. They are subject to the interests of the national and international Wushasi. This reality uh, mainly hits the youth and women, which in this uh, economic and health crisis uh, live in uncertainty. According to official uh, numbers, youth is participates only in 48% of active work, uh, which have uh, seen a reduction of 8.1%. Uh, women uh, represent 40%, and this number has also been reduced due to the pandemic. Uh, young people between 14 and 88 years old um, are 35% of uh, working people and this also has been reduced due to the pandemic. The thing is that the unemployment rate, rate in regarding women is of 30%, and that is on the general situation in Colombia due to the neoliberal policies that have been implemented in Colombia. That is how we have these uh, unadventurable <laughs> results. Uh, but the only rate that actually grew is the one of profitability. We understand that is, there is a close link among uh, informal jobs and the uh, consequences that it has in education. To be able to have a good um, economic uh, structure, the 
uh, education, according to government, only aims to have a cheap uh, workforce. Today, most students in the countries can only access to technological and technical education, which is aimed at this profitability and market logic. And the rest of the youth, which is 40%, has to face uh, educational reality uh, in decay. Public universities are now, now going through a structural crisis because of the cut, cuts on budget. So now uh, the government has an historic debt with higher education of $41 uh, billion. And this deficit is growing towards 20%. And besides, uh, in order to face this crisis, universities have to uh, to be able to have a, a good budget. They try to um, have higher prices for tuition. So then if students want to access a higher education, they need to go to the public universities, which are actually falling apart. They have to take on loans. And they take on loans uh, from the banks. And so the education policies of the right-wing governments have uh, been aimed at the um, education according to demand. So most students go to private universities and this market is strengthened. This has resulted in uh, many issues, uh, especially that the problems of public education is on the shoulders of the working class. So either they get uh, loans or they are pushed towards uh, public education. Today, 52% of the student population has access to public education. Only 30% can graduate. And of that uh, percentage, only 30% gets a job. And from that 30%, only 20% can retire. In the pandemic, uh, the situation has uh, worsened. Um, even highlights issues that were happening before the pandemic, but that now are more exposed. The remote education, which is um, forced to students, um, is very difficult for uh, students because um, Colombia has a really low um, internet and connection speed of 3.4 megas on average, uh, compared to countries like Taiwan, we have, we have 80 as an average. 25% of homes have a computer. And only 42% of the population has access to internet. In this framework and taking into account the crisis of labor precarization, today we have uh, a contradiction because uh, students have to choose between um, eating or using that money to pay tuitions. Under this dynamic, the students movement has participated in many uh, fighting process, being protagonists on the front lines. They are uh, raising different banners to guarantee the access to public education. Uh, they, we demand uh, zero tuition, and we have made uh, an international campaign for that need that it is urgent. Uh, today, students want to access to higher education even in the pandemic. That's why we are fighting, uh, we are having that conflict, and we think that this problem is not going to get solved only with a zero tuition, but that we need a um, deeper reform. 
in which students and teachers need to participate to guarantee education and quality education. And this is possible. And the government, which destines millions of dollars through to the financial sectors, and the only kind of financial help that they have uh, implemented is the issuing of loans. So they have turned the necessities of the Colombian people into a business for the upper class. So that's how we see the need of enhancing uh, organization structures and to be an alternative to these uh, social movements. Today, unions and bureaucracies and student bureaucracies have adopted policies of concessions or changing and reforming through bourgeoisie institutions. Uh, that is a, a strategic move because in bourgeoisie institutions, they are comfortable and they are able to make concessions. Today, our fight is not only, I guess, imperialism and capitalism, but also against uh, those who are allies of the regimes and the bureaucracies. And that's why we have this need of keeping, keep on supporting internationalism because it's the only way in which we can carry out the socialist revolution as a real solution to these issues that we face today. We, uh, because the situation is that of socialism or barbarism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sherson. Now, Karen from Ecuador is speaking. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on the country. Well, everyone's intervention strengthens our understanding of the world in this COVID crisis. So very effective greetings to everyone who's listening. Today, I wish to tell you a bit about the reality in, in Ecuador around online education and precarious labor around those two points. So the lockdown of the population caused by COVID-19 had a strong impact on the educational system because very few people have a internet connection. So it made a, the, the lockdown made all uh, ins educational institutions adopt uh, online studies as a modality, which from a perspective of human rights consists in uh, making necessary um, infrastructure, technological and um, training uh, investments, which uh, have not been done. And the people most affected um, are the students who are also affected by um, a lack of um, funds, a lack of uh, money and resources. And it has affected all the freedom in, in teaching and also the, um, the, the modes of teaching and grading and uh, given grades. So students on top of all this now have to um, put money into a, having an internet connection, for example. And this is not taking into account that many 
geographical areas do not have the infrastructure to have a, a, a working internet connection. And many of the of the uh, universities even do not have a, enough infrastructure to make this happen. And so the teachers um, are obliged to acquire these um, this equipment or or be sanctioned. And so they don't have the material conditions for what they are, uh, what is being demanded of them from taking attendance online uh, to well, all these uh, conditions become uh, more difficult in the more vulnerable areas, uh, in the rural areas, uh, for example has been one of the uh, places most affected. Uh, at the same time, the sexist violence has uh, also not respected the modality of uh, online uh, teaching. So we we are now in a, in a campaign against uh, sexist insults it diffused through online classes and intimidation through uh, online. <clears throat> and uh, the problems women face in these spaces has uh, sharpened even now with a rise in domestic violence during the lockdown. <clears throat> so the pro women's problems in all areas has uh, has become worse with the pandemic. Moving on to uh, the point on precarious labor. In the first place, there is a massive laying off of workers and the level of precarious labor has reached uh, new records and uh, teachers and education has been uh, highly uh, precarized or become precarious with uh, telecommuting being an excuse for demanding the use of um, <clears throat> different resources uh, without previous knowledge of how to use them. And the obligation of meeting a kind of a an amount of, of hours to plan classes that was not foreseen and all of this without being receiving payment for this. <clears throat> and this we can hopefully uh, go into further detail in, in future encounters. So that would be all. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. And now we will hear from Concepcion Martinez from Spain, from the Spanish state. Okay, I'll begin. Hello, everyone. Greetings. First of all, I want to state an issue, which is uh, what is to be young in Spain. Uh, mainly, we are aware of that it can be a privilege if we compare ourselves to other countries of the world and because of that condition that we face. We have listened to other young people in this conference that in our organization, we are proud of uh, how through internationalism, we can understand what has happened historically in the, in the past. And I want to highlight this. And I want to uh, highlight that this is not paradise. And it's a mistake to believe that. Today, the poor cannot access to a living, uh, to ho a home or a house. And we cannot uh, go to live on our own, not even on our 30s. 
on the one hand, we have uh, unemployment, we cannot find uh, a good job, we are vulnerable. On the long term, this generates a uh, social upsetting and these uh, marginalized people, even individually or collectively. In addition, the education system in Spain has suffered great changes through time, which generates um, economic differences and the inability to access education if you don't have uh, economic capital. So students, as a student, we are in a world in which our expectations are impossible, impossible and we have an uncertain future. There is no degree that can save us. Uh, each year can uh, cost up to 1,000 euros, um, plus paying for the place in which we have to live to be able to study. Uh, this costs around 3,000 euros and is too expensive for a working family or even a student. Uh, there is a system of scholarships, but it is insufficient, and the education agreements in the European Union is based on social inequality and all, only precarizes public education. There is an example of this issue. According to a report of working commissions, there's almost one million and a half of people who are in scholarships uh, they are not a uh, cheap workforce, but they are working for free for these scholarships. These kinds of scholarships should aid uh, people and be able to, to, to for, for them. Um, And that is how we get educated and we get jobs which are precarious, so we are not prepared for more professional jobs. So we have to take into account that most of us work in tourism and that's the highest positions that we can reach. There is a lack of participation of youth in unions due to the precarization of our first jobs. So we have a whole generation that is doomed in unemployment. To be young here, as in the rest of the world, is a constant fight against capitalism, which wants to control us and to stop us. The European system has been able to control the youth. But the fight, since the policies against the youth have been several um, on these last years, we can talk about a law uh, of social security, which is against the youth, which has revealed uh, you can have even uh, up to three years in prison because of carrying out terrorist activities only for protesting so that they could control um, social protests. Since 2015, under this law, uh, the government was able to sentence uh, many people for those so-called crimes. This system is taking advantage of this economic crisis uh, and now in this crisis is able to push forward worse conditions. That's what they sell us as, new, as a new normality. There are old problems. They have made agreements with the national bourgeoisie to worsen our conditions. And this results in more precarity. We want to call all youth to fight against this. Uh, health workers have protested against the situation. Immigrants and the unemployed are fighting against unemployment. We want to change this by turning everything over. That's the path that we have to follow and that we have to support. From our party, we will keep on working on this and supporting that path. Thank you so much. Thank you, Concepcion. And now,
Uh, here from Rocio from France, from the commune. Hello to all comrades. In this uh, meeting of the youth, I get to explain how these problems of the youth are reflected in France. I'll do it in the first place from the point of view of the recent pact of Macron and Angela Merkel and 27 countries. And in second place, through a, the speech made by Macron and his minister. The first is the European Union Agreement, which is, as the Spanish comrade said, is meant to impose a new normality. So this pact that Macron and Merkel have been discussing of uh, the e economic stimulus package. So this multi-million euro package was approved for uh, attacking the, the economic crisis supposedly caused by COVID. And supposedly the 360 billion were supposed to are earmarked for the most vulnerable countries and the other half for the rest. And France will get 40 billion of that agreement, of that package. Now the questions we have around this are around what are the areas in which this uh, package will be distributed in. In first place is part of this investment will be for financing the measures that were taken during the lockdown. So in covering what the state has spent during the lockdown to uh, help mainly the big businesses. So this package will cover all that money that Macron already spent lining the pockets of big businesses. And So when Air France or these big com companies uh, are in crisis and need money, Macron has it. And uh, when it's necessary for other needs of the people, um, this is uh, this implies austerity and cutting budgets. And this is far from what is needed, uh, like a big investment in health to have more beds and much more personnel, a plan that can uh, get online education and connectivity to everyone who today doesn't have it, the generation of uh, labor, uh, real labor, not precarious labor, jobs, So this is what would be needed. And uh, we ask if this package that they have approved will have these objectives or has more to do with uh, Macron uh, standing, uh, postulating himself for a leading position in the European Union. And on July 14th, on, on this celebration of uh, France, of the French Revolution in the speeches that Macron and his ministers made had to do with uh, the phase of new normality that they want to impose. But what is this new normality? If we see what will happen in Europe, we're talking about a 
a new wave of infections in which we don't know if there will be a new lockdown or even in some countries uh, measures to wear face masks and those minimal things. <clears throat> and there is more priority based on opening countries for the summer vacations and the tourism industry and not in uh, health recommendations. Since in reality, the normality and the health necessities can't be uh, imposed by a government. So the education minister on July 14th uh, <coughs> offered his plan which will impose a new demands on teachers uh, to um, recover the days lost during the pandemic without the necessary health precautions in the middle of a possible new wave. So we ask what are the necessary measures to guarantee uh, education and taking care of students and teachers' health. What are, for example, the conditions of uh, students that live in the periphery, uh, their housing conditions, their living conditions? We know the numbers of um, scholarships that were not granted. in a country in which third cycle students are largely self-sustaining with their jobs. And none of this is considered by the president or the minister of education. So none of these rights are taken into, uh, into consideration. And this has been the reality of students during the lockdown, locked in their houses, many in their condition of immigrants with a cut in with cuts in in state funding and without the scholarships that they depend on while their precarious work especially in delivery apps was a, increased in many times fold exposing them to a higher possibilities of infection without the, the necessary uh, things like masks even being guaranteed by Uber Eats and the different app businesses. So they have been exposed to all of the uh, health hazards. And from the president and the minister, we heard none of these problems. We heard about none of these problems. This doesn't mean that working conditions were worsened uh, just by the lockdown. They had been worsening for a long time and labor rights had been under attack for a long time. Now, with the pandemic, all of this was made worse. And who were most hit were uh, people of color, immigrants, and the poor. So the governments of the European Union are uh, preparing to see how they make us pay for the cost of the crisis. But workers are fighting back. Women are fighting back in the streets as well. The result will, of that struggle will depend on the very class struggle. And we'll have a, an important point of inflection in the role of the youth in the streets. Thank you, Rocio. Now we will hear from Raul Gomez from Ni un repartidor menos from Mexico. Hello, everyone, comrades. It's a pleasure to meet you. 
I cannot turn on the camera. I don't know why. There it is. First of all, dear comrades from all over the world, I would like to honor all those uh, comrades that have unfortunately died here in Mexico. Yesterday, someone uh, threw, threw a comrade from a bridge, a uh, delivery comrade. So I would like to take uh, a moment of silence for our fallen comrade. In memory of Ivan del Monte, thank you all for understand this for understanding this minute of silence. Uh, the reality that all of us um, go through, the uh, our us precarious workers, um, also pushes us to realize that it's not only we that go through these kinds of situations. For example, the deliveries from apps, as you heard from other comrades. This struggle has to join us all, and it has to take us to acknowledge um, others and to be acknowledged, uh, domestic workers, taxi drivers, uh, teachers, because here we think that defending teachers is defending the future of education in the whole world. We believe, and we also have expressed it before, that we have to be coherent and consistent with, with what we say and what we do. So thank you for taking us into account. Uh, nowadays, we see how governments of all the world try to desperately us, tell us to stay at home, to use our masks. We see how the government of my country, well, did not know how to carry out this contingency and is saying that no, nothing's happening. And if you attack it and all other persons come against you because they think uh, that you are trying to worsen the situation. We also celebrate today um, the second strike of the comrades in Brazil. Uh, you have all our support to seek um, working rights is a fight that unites us all. It is a fight that uh, makes us say and acknowledge that we need each other, you, me, and everyone else. 
Today, for example, here in Mexico, we have a debate and strong debate about the uh, single vital income for Mexicans and for many other countries of Latin America. We all need that in a pandemic. Why should you go to work in these kinds of situations in which businesses in which we work have not even made one effort uh, to protect us? On the contrary, many of them has, have lowered the prices of delivery trips and also many people, unfortunately, have been uh, sick and have not uh, gotten any help from any of the apps. They have sought for support in other groups to get help. And they have to acknowledge that they need help. And that's why we also acknowledge every other fight in every country that is here today. We may have different perspectives, but the objective is the same. We need a change. We not, cannot allow uh, things to go further the same. We need to express that we are sick of this, of eating bread with worms. We cannot even allow uh, them to attack those who uh, concentrate and mobilize. For us who mobilize, uh, because we think that it is fair uh, to our, uh, for our working rights to be acknowledged. acknowledged. Um, and for that single fact of, of showing opposition, uh, those people have been repressed because of the color of their skin, they have been oppressed because they are immigrants, even in Mexico. In Mexico, we discriminate each other because some of us have indigenous uh, features and some don't. And this happens in a multicultural country. The fight that we carry on and that we share with many comrades around the world is this one. It doesn't matter how modern and updated the app is. It doesn't matter that if it says that it uses a new operative systems or whatever. It is the moment for apps to share their profits. Without us and the other delivery comrades, they are nothing. Thank you all. Greetings from Mexico. Thank you, Saul. Uh, we ask you to be brief. Now we will hear from Amarilis from Anti-Capitalist Alternative of Nicaragua. Hi, comrades of the International Socialist League. It, it is great to see each other again, discussing this plan of struggle and resistance for world revolution. In Central America, the youth represents 38% of the population. Thousands of youth uh, do not have a quality health or education or quality jobs. Most of the youth suffers structural violence, serious economic limitations, and the consequences of forced migration and political exile. Situation that makes us a specially vulnerable group. The national states limit our participation in politics, especially young women who, uh, besides being isolated from the system, suffers sexist violence, sexist and patriarchal violence. We are excluded from the process of participation and decision-making. We have the lowest salaries <clears throat> in Nicaragua because of the pandemic. Over 10,000 women have been fired from textile and other industries and maintaining responsibilities of family care. 
in Nicaragua specifically, seven out of 10 young people do not have formal employment. One of the strong realities we face each year is the lack of opportunities for our development. Our options, our, our young people are more and more difficult. They are call centers, in, say, selling things on the street, in delivery, franchises, textile and manufacture, critical, and there's a critical le level of unemployment, which elevates the levels of crime and insecurity in, the, in society. All of this happens under the watch of the governments and great financial, uh, national and foreign capitals. The bosses are, they say, say the bosses say that we are essential. This is true, uh, but for them, we are also uh, discardable. Their plans of austerity, their, the, the plans of austerity that they and the IMF have. In 2018, uh, Nicaraguan youth uh, headed a strong mobilization against the regime of Ortega and Murillo, which was sparked by the, um, the pension reform imposed by the IMF. The dictatorship of Ortega and Murillo and their state terrorism offers expulsion, exile, torture, um, jail, and death. Uh, but there is also a false opposition headed by um, capitalists, the church, and corrupt political parties uh, of this coalition that has nothing to offer us. But uh, we will not give up. This reality is not so different in, for example, El Salvador, where the government took an enormous debt with the IMF and militarized the country. or in Honduras, where there was a precarious system of health and laws that uh, definanced it even more. In 2019, they tried to privatize the, the health system and educational system, but there was a very strong strike uh, with assemblies and mobilizations that, uh, that defeated it. In Costa Rica, uh, the students also uh, mobilized in 2019 against uh, budget cuts in education. So in Central America, uh, the mestizo community in Central America uh, is not the only one that is uh, precar under precarized um, labor and lives the indigenous people and uh, Afro-American uh, population also experiences the capitalist depredation and the, destru the destruction of their uh, habitats, of their, um, the contamination of their waters and the destruction of the ancestral lands of these peoples. So we support the self-determination, the struggle uh, for the self-determination of these peoples. So the governments uh, intend us not to organize to fight against this. So what do we respond that we're not going to organize? No, uh, there's no way. We're going to organize to turn this system over, the system that tries to kill us. This system does not let us live. That is why we, we come out massively and continue to organize and protest and propose our, our own solution. And we know that uh, our struggle is the same one that many have in, in, in many other places. So we ask you to join us and in Central America, join a anti-capitalist alternative in the ISL because we have everything to win. So let's build this organization and change everything in Nicaragua and in Central America.